Good Sunday morning, everybody. How's it going? Time for another Seahawks video. We're going to be detouring a little bit from recent conversation topics and going into a really interesting John Boyle article that was published a few days ago. Now, before I get into this article, you may notice that things are a little bit different right now. There's no green screen, and you also may be able to pick up on a slight slight degrading in the audio quality. Basically, I've been using NVIDIA Broadcast for the last year plus to do video and audio streaming and recording, and it's worked great. And then over the last handful of days, it suddenly decided, hey, I'm going to take up 90% of your CPU when you're idle. And whatever percentage of your CPU is left with whatever else you're doing, I'm taking up all of it. It was killing my computer. I had to uninstall it, actually. I, I just had to make it completely go away. It was like a like a virus, It's almost. It was just constantly turning on and eating up all my space. And it affected the quality of some videos and streams, I think. The uh, audio quality on the uh, Mariners video I did yesterday was really bad. So I'm working on an alternative solution. But until then, I don't have green screen and I don't have noise cancellation. If you hear like my fan in the background or you hear some ambient noises in the background, then I'm sorry. I uh, will work to fix this issue as soon as I can. So that out of the way, uh, hopefully I can get that resolved this week. I want to talk about this article because uh, I know this one's a few days old now and most people have already talked about it. It's already kind of gotten a lot of people's attention. People have already gone over it, but I initially wasn't going to do a video about it. I was just going to talk about it on Twitch a little bit. And we talked about it a little bit when I streamed with the Hawk's Nest. But after having the opportunity to really look at this article and consider it from a few different perspectives, there's actually something educational here. There's actually something genuinely interesting here. This is not just a, a fluff piece designed to make Pete Carroll and John Schneider and uh, Chuck Arnold and Jody Allen seem more human. No, th there was actually some stuff here that, if true, and it seems to be true, I, I don't think John Boyle and company are just completely making it all up to make themselves look better, but I actually found this to be genuinely interesting. And even though it's a few days old, and even though some of the gas is out of the tank, I want to discuss what this article had to say and what it says about this current regime. So basically, John Boyle went inside the Seahawks draft room on days one and two of the 2022 NFL draft. So uh, Thursday and Friday, where we made the four picks of Cross, Mafe, Walker, and uh, Lucas. So he had a lot of interesting things to say. And at first, I wasn't paying this article that much attention. I assumed it was going to be another meaningless fluff piece by a softball Seattle sports writer, but no, no, not the case. There's actually some good stuff in here, and I, I want to talk about it a little bit and talk about what I'm taking away from it. So let's uh, go through this. This is He basically offers up a, uh, a timeline of some of the things that are happening as day one and day two go on, and I'm not going to go over everything, but I want to go over some of the stuff that caught my attention here. So Early on day one, or well, early in the draft portion, right? So 5.30, uh, 40 minutes after the draft started, the Seahawks were talking with the Giants about trading up from number nine to number seven. Now, I don't know what you would have to give up to trade up from nine to seven. You might have been looking at your third round pick. At the very least, you're looking at a fourth round pick, I have to believe. So there was that conversation. And ultimately, they couldn't come to an agreement, and they decided to not make the trade. Now, looking at the way the draft went and looking at some information that we gained from later in this article, I think it's pretty clear that we were trading up to get, make sure we could get Charles Cross. It seems to me that the plan was either we sit at nine and hope we get Cross, or we trade up to seven and pretty much guarantee we get cross. So 
If that is indeed the case, and I very strongly believe that it is based off what we learn later in this article, in fact, I think it kind of has to be, then that should make Seahawks fans feel good. We did not have to trade up and we got the guy we were trying to get anyway. So that that's going to make you feel good as a Seahawks fan, I think. Uh, scrolling down a little bit more, the article goes on to say that Akem Ekwanwu was one of the tackles that the Seahawks had near the top of their board. They do not specify whether or not Ekwanwu was above cross, but based off what is said in the next little blurb here, I think he probably was. So it seems like the Seahawks had Ekwanwu as their number one tackle. That's my perception on this. It's not guaranteed to be true. He doesn't specify, but given the fact that he does specify in this next part, I kind of believe that Ikwanwu was. So here he goes on to say that the Giants used their other first round pick, which is the number seven that the Seahawks considered trading up for on Evan Neal. And the article specifically says he was not the highest rated tackle on the board, Evan Neal. Cross was ranked above Neal. So number one, that indicates to me that Aquanwu probably was ranked above Cross, which is totally reasonable. But I want to talk about this here. We had Cross above Evan Neal. So think about the Seahawks over the last several, uh, several years. And maybe you would even go like dozen years since Pete got here. And think about Evan Neal. Big dude. Giant. Road grader great run blocker, might end up playing right tackle, might even end up slotting into guard, a mauler, just, just a big, strong dude who overpowers people, Alabama offensive lineman. We know what those guys typically do. Charles Cross spent most of his college career protecting the passer, pass blocker, finesse player, much smaller than Neil. I think Neil has like 35 to 40 pounds on him. So. Of those two players, who do you think the traditional Seahawks under Carroll would have preferred? They want the road grader. And yet, faced with an elite mauler and an elite pass-protecting technician, the Seahawks preferred Cross over Neal. So, I don't know what to credit that to. Either Carroll has completely changed his philosophy here, or... He's not the one making the final call on this stuff, and that is being handed to uh, Mr. Shane Waldron. He would probably much prefer a lighter, more mobile, more technically sound player like a cross over a Neal. So the fact that we had cross ranked above Neal is something that I personally really like, not just because I prefer cross to Neal, which I do, but it also kind of tells me that Shane Waldron was heavily involved in that decision. So... That really caught my attention maybe more than anything else in this article. So as for the remainder of our first round, basically the the Falcons were picking at eight and either the Falcons were going to pick somebody who wasn't cross and then we would be really happy we got cross. And then, or the Falcons get cross and then the Seahawks would have apparently not been in a very happy situation. They wouldn't have known what to do. They may have traded down. Cross is, at this point, apparently the only guy left that they feel great about getting at number nine. So the Falcons end up taking a receiver, Drake London, and the room is really happy. So we got a little bit fortunate here. So all these things that are happening on the first day are good news one way or another, as far as I'm concerned. We didn't trade up when it ended up being unnecessary. We got the guy we wanted despite not trading up and despite having to sweat it out a little bit. Um, we, we got a guy who I think is probably preferred by our offensive coordinator rather than our defensive-minded head coach. I like these things. So we get um, Charles Cross, and then um, I'm, I'm not going to go into too many of the uh, details of picking Cross. It's, I, go watch the clips on YouTube of Guys like Cross and Walker and Mafe getting the phone call. Those are always fun. Definitely check those out. But I guess the one interesting thing that did happen here was that uh, some team, we don't know which team, called about trading up to number nine. And the Seahawks did consider trading back a couple spots and hoping they could still get Cross. But 
ultimately they decided they didn't want to risk it. They wanted to make sure they could get Charles Cross. So there was no trade, and then they uh, selected Charles Cross. Uh, the only other thing of note from the first round, and I, I this is going to be important later. Uh, excuse me. There was talk of trading up to the back end of the first round to get a pass rusher. So not a quarterback. A lot of people were saying, oh, the Seahawks should trade up to like 32 or 31 to get their quarterback. Apparently, we wanted to trade up to that range. We talked about trading up with Tampa Bay at 27 and Green Bay at 28. And we ended up not doing it. But the goal was to get a pass rusher. Now, with that being said, keep in mind who we ended up picking at 40. So who was the pass rusher? That is something that we'll never know for sure, but it seems likely that it was Arnold Ebiketti, Jermaine Johnson, or Boye Mafe, or some combination of those three guys. Apparently, according to this article, it was probably not Jermaine Johnson. So we may have been looking at trading up into the back end of the first round to get Probably Ebi Ketty, but also maybe Boye Mafe. So what I'm trying to say here is that we got one of those guys anyway. Now, I know a lot of people are going to say, oh, I wish we had gotten Ebi Ketty instead. But Ebi Ketty went just a few picks in front of us, I think. He, he went to, uh, I think, Atlanta. So trading up into the back end of the first round up to 27 or 28 would have actually been kind of overselling it a little bit. So not making that trade and still getting one of those guys, really good. So going down through here, uh, this is the part of the article that makes you think it's not Jermaine Johnson. Uh, he goes 26th. It's not one of the two pass rushers the Seahawks have in mind. So Seattle had a deal in place with Green Bay, but uh, Green Bay backed out of it at the last second. They decided they would rather use the pick than trade it. So apparently we were trading up to 28. We were ready to go. And based off the information that we have, I think we were planning on taking Ebi Ketty. So knowing what we would have had to have given up to move up, probably our third round pick, would you rather, just say it in the comments, would you rather have gotten Mafe and Lucas or would you rather have gotten just Ebi Ketty? Because I know a lot of people liked Ebi Ketty more than Mafe. I did not. But if you did, do you like him better by enough to give up Abraham Lucas? So uh, there continues to be no real trades. Um, uh, one thing I want to say is that I would assume that every single draft pick, except for maybe like one or two overall, is probably discussed in trade this talks at some point, right? That That's just how this works. So just because somebody calls about a, a trade, for a pick or picks doesn't necessarily make it hugely uh, newsworthy. So with that being said, let's move on into uh, day two and figure out what interesting stuff we can learn from what happened here. So Tampa Bay selected Logan Hall, not one of Seattle's targets, according to Boyle. So it wasn't Logan Hall. And that leads you to believe it's far, it's, it's even more likely that it was Epi Ketty and Mafe were the two targets. Um, Green Bay took Watson, also not one of Seattle's targets, which is interesting because we looked at him at some point, apparently, and he was one of the few receivers I had high on my big board for Seattle, but apparently we ultimately decided we weren't that interested in him. Um, there were a couple of calls the Seahawks got to trade back at 40 or 41, but nothing really manifested. Um... The Jets take Brees Hall at 36, and Boyle is not clear on whether or not Hall was ranked above Walker, but he makes it very clear they are both ranked very closely, and they are both clearly the best two running backs in the draft, according to the Seahawks. Now, that was pretty much the case according to everybody. Hall and Walker were one and two on pretty much every list in some order, but um, I... I, well, I just can't, it's really hard to figure out who the Seahawks would have valued higher at that spot between Hall and Walker. I liked Hall a little bit better, but 
it's close. It's real close. Uh, another call about a potential trade to the Seahawks. Um, the room deflated a little bit when the Falcons selected Ebi Ketty. So very clearly, if the Seahawks had traded up to 27, or as it ended up being 28, Ebi Ketty would have been the pick. So you would have over-traded by like eight or nine slots to get Ebi Ketty, which I understand that a lot of guys really like Ebi Ketty. I really liked him too. But you would have had to give up significant draft capital, probably your third round pick to move up that much when you didn't need to, when in reality, all you had to do was move up maybe three or four spots in the second round. Maybe you get away with just giving up a fifth round pick or at, at worst, it's a fourth round pick. Maybe it's even a pick next year. You can kick that can down the road a little bit. So the implication that I get is that Ebi Ketty was ranked above Mafe, but it's not made clear in this article. So there's a little bit of fluff in here about how uh, Jody Allen was involved in the process, but wasn't really focused on the exact details of this player versus that player. Um, after the Bears took Kyler Gordon, the Seahawks decided they were just going to make two back-to-back -back picks. And apparently the decision to take Mafe was very easy because, again, there's at least some possibility Seattle was going to trade up into the first to get him. So Boye Mafe being there at 40 was a relative no-brainer. The interesting thing here is the Walker pick because supposedly the Seahawks were deciding between him and an offensive lineman. We don't know which offensive lineman. And supposedly Shane Waldron was brought into the conversation to see what he felt. So I don't know who this offensive lineman could have been, but a lot of people think, and this would be really exciting if true, that it was Abraham Lucas. So you make the decision to get Walker, who I guarantee you would have been drafted in that second round, over Lucas, who you assume is not going to be there in the third, and then he is there in the third. So if we actually made that decision, then boy, did we make the right decision. Another guy that I think it could have been at that selection would have been uh, Cam Jurgens, the uh, center, who, uh, God, I, I can't remember who he went to, but he did end up going considerably higher than I thought the uh that look that we can have a debate on would you rather have had Walker the third or would you rather have had Cam Jurgens? I don't mind the way it turned out but Cam Jurgens was nice so I'm relatively ambivalent on that I I don't mind kicking the can down the road on center until next year I think that's totally reasonable you don't want to have three rookies on the offensive line necessarily but that may have been the decision the team made as well so there's some more uh, stuff on Mafe. There's some more stuff on Walker. Uh, Chad Morton was very happy that we got Walker. And then it fast forwards to our 72nd overall pick when Abraham Lucas was still there. And we will never know if he was the guy they actually were planning on taking at number uh, number 41. But it seems very believable to me. A lot of people thought that Walker, I'm um, sorry, Lucas was going to go in the second. Some people thought he was going to go in the back end of the first. So I absolutely buy it. I think that this team clearly recognized a need at both tackle positions. And it would not have shocked me at all if we, I would have been happy taking Lucas in the second round. I, if we had taken Lucas at 41, I would have been like, yeah, that's a good pick. I like it. I probably would have given it like an A minus or an A. Getting him in the third round, though, like, when you read this article, and I understand it's written by a Seattle sports media member, and you don't totally trust those guys, but you read this article, it really seems like the Seahawks got everything to fall their way. They didn't make the trades up that they ended up not needing to make. They still got the guys they wanted to get despite not trading up. Um, things fell their way to where players they didn't like that much went ahead of them. Like there was a lot of talk about upsets in this article where a team would pick a player the Seahawks did not have on their big board. They call that an upset because, and, and in this context, upsets are good because you want players that you don't desire to go to other teams. Apparently we didn't really like Jermaine Johnson that much. So according to this article, we liked Ebi Ketty and Mafe more than Jermaine Johnson, even though Jermaine Johnson was being talked about as a top 15 pick at one point. Um, guys like uh, Christian Watson, apparently we didn't have on our big board. Logan Hall was not that high on our big board. So things kept going our way. The only thing that 
maybe stung a little bit from these first two days was not getting Ebi Ketty and getting Mafe instead, but it didn't seem like anyone was that unhappy about it. So this is really interesting. I think it shows how well this draft went for Seattle, and I think it also showcases that the mentality of this team is changing a little bit. Waldron seemed to be heavily involved in all three of the picks on offense. Like the, These have Shane Waldron's fingerprints all over them. But I do have to ask, of the different paths our draft could have taken a couple, a few we- a couple weeks ago, presented here, where we could have traded up, we could have traded down, um, you know, taking our chances on not getting cross and maybe settling for something else. All these things that you're reading about that, oh, we could have traded up to get Epi Ketty and given up the Lucas pick, probably. Would you have preferred any of that over what we got? So... You can answer that question in the comments if you want to, but I'm going to get out of here. Thanks for watching. Peace out, Go Hawks, and let me know what you think.